Will you join with me as we pray, as we start our, our, our service this morning? Father, um, we are so grateful for who you are, for what you have done in our lives and for us in, in the person of Christ, that um, God left to ourselves, we are hopeless, that we all fall short, and yet out of your great love for us, you sent uh, a Savior that we could um, be redeemed, that we could be forgiven, that we could um, be yours and be with you forever including right now in this moment. So God, as we open up your word this morning, help us to understand. We pray that your Holy Spirit would, would, would teach us, that uh, we would be exposed to your truth, but not only that, God, that we would be transformed, that we would be encouraged, that we would be sharpened and shaped by your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Desperate. Desperate was one of those terms, one of those identifiers that you not, did not want to be called as a teenager, right? I mean, there, there were certain terms that you didn't mind, like if you're the jock, if you're considered athletic, or if you were smart, being intelligent, you didn't, you didn't mind those things. But desperate uh, was a word that you did not want to be called because you knew that somebody that was considered desperate, they could have five different relationships before Christmas break. Uh, it could be the kind of thing that they, they ended one relationship on Tuesday and there was the new love of their life on Friday, right? You did not want to be called desperate. But desperate, it's something that we've all experienced in some way or another in our lives and there are so many people that are desperate in life. Uh, there, there are people that are desperate for attention and will do any number of things in order to receive it. Uh, there are those that are desperate for belonging and they will compromise their principles or their morals or their beliefs just to have it. There are those that are desperate to cling to success of years gone by and so they will use every opportunity to tout their accomplishments of what they did back in the day. There are those who are desperate for their youth and will do any number of procedures or, or things in order to try to capture what was lost even after those years are, are long past. There are those that are desperate for money or possessions and will do any number of things to get what they can get to acquire what they desire. There are those that are desperate for relief and will do drastic measures, go to great extent, just in hopes of finally having some relief, some sense of peace, some reprieve from the grind. Desperate. Uh, it's something that few of us would admit to because to be desperate would by nature expose a, an eagerness, a, a yearning of our hearts, and we know that... Um, Oftentimes, we don't want to be considered overzealous over anything. We don't want to really put ourselves out there to that degree because when you are overeager or overzealous and your heart is exposed, there's great risk to having your heart exposed. And yet, uh, we realize that there is a yearning of our hearts, that there is a, a desperation to our hearts. Now, as we look at being desperate or, or desperation, we're, we're going to see that Desperation in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a matter of what is it that we are desperate for? What is it that we are going after? What is it that we are seeking to fulfill to fill that gap, fill that yearning of our hearts? And the question is, is what we are desperate for actually going to lead us to any life-giving hope? Is it going to lead us to anything that is ultimately going to sustain us. And what we're going to see this morning in Psalm 42 is, is the song of a, of a desperate man, a song of desperate people. And, and I'm sure that as we open this up, you're going to find yourself somewhere in the midst of this song, somewhere in the midst of this struggle. We're going to continue our series this morning entitled Songs of Summer. Um, if you have not been with us over this summer, we are going through various psalms as we have, are, are looking at these expressions of, of God's people to God that, that just hit the realities of life, where, where we're at, where it's not just in, in the good times, but when it's in the difficult 
times as well. And we continue that this morning as we look at Psalm 42. I want to encourage you to turn there uh, with me this morning. Psalm 42, starting in verse 1, it says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one. With shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Nazar, deep calls to deep, and the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where's your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now this morning as we look at Psalm 42, this is the first one that we are going through together that is not written by David. Um, as you know, if you've been a part of our series, every other psalm that we have gone through so far has been written by David. This is the first one that we see was written by the sons of Korah. And what we know of these guys is that um, they were uh, guys that wrote psalms for the assembly of God's people that were to be sung in the worship of God's people. Theologians believe that Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 are actually one song that has been broken up. So I, I want to encourage you um, later today to, to check out Psalm 43 as well as the common themes and even a common refrain is brought up in, in both uh, of these chapters. But what we're going to see in Psalm 42 and what, what we see here is just that this author is in this state of desperation. This songwriter that is crying out, and, and first of all, it kind of sounds like this nice, picturesque scene. He starts out in verse 1, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Now, now it sounds quite picturesque. It sounds like the kind of thing that would make a nice painting on the wall, that there's a deer and a nice stream of water, and it, it sounds really simple, really beautiful. In fact, even if you grew up in the church, you might have sung the song, As the Deer Pants for the Water, and that sounded really nice. As the deer pants for the water. And it, it was just nice. And yet what we see in this psalm is that it is utter desperation that he is experiencing. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a deer pant. I, I can't say that I myself have seen a deer pant, but I've seen a dog pant. I, I've seen a dog as its tongue is going out. I mean, even in the last week when it was so hot, and probably you yourself could say you were panting. You know, you, you go outside, and it doesn't take a whole lot. I mean, I, I, I walked outside, I'm out there, and I blinked a couple times, and I was like drenched. I was like, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I, I'm panting. And, 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 and in those moments where you are just yearning for some relief, if you've been outside and your throat's getting dry, and it's like, my goodness, I just need something. I need to restore what was lost. You realize that yearning for just some fresh water, something that is going to soothe, that's going to provide some sense of relief, that is the cry of this psalmist as he's saying, in that way, he is looking to God to provide that relief that only God can provide. This, this great, this immense yearning of his heart, he is crying out to God to provide that for him. We see in verse 1, he says, my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Have you ever had those times where you are just crying out to God? Where it, it doesn't seem like just simple, nice prayers. Thank you for this food. Please bless this day, blah, blah, blah. But it is crying out to God. Those moments where, those seasons of life where you feel desperate. 
If so, maybe you're in one of those seasons right now where there's just stuff that has been hitting the fan, and you're just like, I, I don't know how much more of this I can take. Well, hopefully you're going to find some relief within this psalm today, because one of the things we see within this, the first point, the cries of the desperate find their refuge in God. Uh, another way of saying that, we could, we could also say that the cries of the desperate find their satisfaction in God. The, the cries of the desperate find their consolation in God. They find their hope in God. You know, over the years there have been countless songs written about desire. Um, everything from the desire for somebody else, for somebody that is going to complete them, that special someone, that beautiful someone, that desire for that person, or the desire for um, things. I, I remember like early 90s, there was a song, I Want to Be Rich. Remember that one? Maybe if you're in the same generation I was, it was, the, I want money, lots and lots. Of, okay, someone's singing along. I, I hear you. The whole desire of the heart of, if I just have this, then I will be content. And yet the common refrain among these songs is, I can't get no satisfaction. Is that only God can provide what the heart is truly yearning for. You see, any desire that we have that is greater than our desire for God is idolatry. It is pursuing something that we believe that can answer our need that God himself cannot. You see, when we are desperate for God, our desperation for God is the one pursuit that does not need rebuke, that does not need correction, that does not go overboard. Because you can never have too much God. You can never know enough about God. You can never be surrendered enough to God. There's never this point where we would say on this side of eternity where it's like, hey, I have it all together. I have enough of God. I mean, have you ever had someone in your life that you would say was really needy? And they just, it was like, they just kind of leached onto you. And you're like, Oh, you're, you're trying to kind of provide some kind of separation because you realize, okay, this, this need that this person has, that they're looking for me to fulfill, I can't meet that need. I, I can't do that. God is never like that for us. When we are crying out for God and desperate for God, God's never saying, whoa, wait a minute, you're getting too close. Um, I, I, gave, I gave some of me to you yesterday. What are you coming after me today for? See, God alone satisfies the longing of our hearts, and yet at the same time, it can be said that we are too easily satisfied with what we know of God. Let, let, me, let me break that down a little bit. God satisfies the longing of our human hearts, and yet at times we are so easily satisfied with, okay, I have enough of God of all I need. Like, for instance, let's say as our service is going on, and, you know, we're starting to get around 1030, and you didn't have breakfast, and you're like, man, I'm getting hungry. I'm wondering what we're doing for lunch. And as the service is going on, it's like, man, I'm getting more hungry. We got we to gotta go somewhere. And, and, and afterwards, you decide, okay, kids, we're going to Pizza Ranch. And you go to Pizza Ranch, and you're going, you know, trip after trip, and you're getting all your pizza, you're getting your fill, and you get to the point where, you know, you, you finish your drink, and you're like, oh, I should not have finished the drink, because now I'm afraid, like, when I stand up, I'm just going to blow up. Where you, where you are so satisfied, like, oh, my goodness, I cannot eat another thing. I am so satisfied. And, and that last year, you're like, okay, that, that meal satisfied you. But come Friday, you're not going, ah, oh, Pizza Ranch, I am so satisfied. Because you're realizing every moment is this opportunity where you need that fill. In the same way, God satisfies the longing of our hearts. But it does not mean that we can just put things on cruise control like, okay, well, you know, I, I, I did that on Sunday. Where there needs to be a continual desperation for God because he alone satisfies that need. And so often, it's in those desperate times and those difficult times when we realize the depth of our desperation for God, isn't it? Those times when our hearts are just crying out and what this psalm does is it, it captures that so well. Because what we see here is in those times when it seems like maybe God is far off. Maybe, the, maybe those times when it seems like, is God really hearing us? Maybe those times where maybe you're praying and it, it feels like, you know, it seems like God has his phone shut off. 
It, it seems like the prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. You're like, hello, is this thing on? Is, is this doing any good? Is there going to be any relief from this? Is this actually working? And, and if so, if you've been there, you're going to relate to what the psalmist is talking about, even this battle of discouragement. Look at verse 3. He says, my tears have been my food day and night. Have you ever had those seasons where life is just hard and, and, and you wake up and there's really nothing to look forward to? It, it, it's, just, it's just difficult and, and there is what the, the, the burdens of the day and, and things that are happening and there's no reprieve and the last thing you realize as you're going to bed at night is it's just tears and you are surprised that your body can hold so much water that you've lost so much water just through your tears that as you go to bed at night your pillow is just soaked with tears and you wake up and the next day it's, it's the same thing. That's where the psalmist was, that his tears have been his food day and night, where it seems like maybe the world is against you. Maybe at times it even seems like God is against you, where there doesn't really see, seem to be any consolation. It doesn't seem to be any reprieve. It seems like you're going round after round with things, and you're just waiting for the knockout. You're like, I, I don't think I can take much more of this. You just want to tap out. You're waiting for the knock. I go, okay, just where's the blow that's just going to finally take me out? Or it seems like you're on the merry-go-round. It's going round and around. You're like, okay, I'm so done with this ride. I just want to get off of this ride. I, I'm so tired of this. And, and, and so there is the discouragement. There's the anxiety. There's the disappointment. There is the grief. And you begin to question, maybe it's just you. You come to church, and it might seem like, man, it seems like everybody else kind of has it together. They come in, they're smiling, they're having their coffee, they're talking, they're coming in as a couple, or they're coming in as a family, or it seems like they have friends, or it seems like things at their workplace are going well, and, and it seems like, are you the only one that is struggling in this way? Because it seems like everyone else has smiles. It seems like everyone else is doing all right, and you start to wonder, is it only you? The struggle of, it seems like there's no new prayers to be said. It seems like every time you're offering that prayer of, in, in the midst of the struggle, that it's an old prayer. It seems like, okay, there's nothing new to be said about this. It seems like all those prayers are kind of old hat. And you're kind of wishing that there was something new that could be said to kind of express where you're at. But man, there's, there's nothing. You're waiting for that reprieve. And if so, you can relate to what this psalmist is saying verse 4 as he is pouring out his soul before God as he is admitting that he is discouraged as he reveals in verse 5 that his heart is downcast he's asking himself why are you downcast and in other words he's saying in despair his heart being in despair that this is not just like one of those happy little peppy songs, but in the midst of this immense grief and discouragement, it even seems like he's drowning in grief and trouble in verse 7. Ever been there, that feeling of being overwhelmed, where it seems like you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, where it seems like you're never going to get out of the situation that you're in, where it seems like all is lost, it's all dark, and this is just where it's at. He, he describes it as being hit by waves, by these breaker waves. If you've ever had the opportunity to swim in the ocean, where you experience some of those kind of waves, at first it's kind of fun, you swim out there, and the first wave hits you, and it's like, whoa, and then they might take you down, okay? It, it takes you down, and in that moment, you realize how out of control you are, where one of those waves hits you and it might take you down and you scrape up on the bottom and then you come back up and you gasp for air and another wave hits you. And you go back down and you tumble around a little bit and you're like, <laughs> you come back up and then all of a sudden it gets to this point like, okay, this isn't so much fun. I, I'm going to go by the kids where it's knee high, where I can breathe. Because you realize you're getting hit wave after wave, and what he is describing here is these waves overwhelming him, these breakers coming over him. And yet in the midst of that, looking at that God is sovereign, that these are his waves, that he is still in control, that not all is lost, that even in these moments, God is still God. What is clear in, in these moments when it seems like there's no reprieve, 
these moments when we face great discouragement, if we're going to get through, it's, it's not going to be through doing it alone. That, that it's not, okay, just, you know, saddle up, cowboy, get it, get it together. It's not just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's about crying out to God. It's about being open and honest before God. And I'm so grateful that God invites us to do that. That God gave us the example in doing that where it's not just pretending that life is grand or that you have it all together in those moments, but it's in crying out to the God who loves us so much and is there for us even in those times. Because second point, the temptation in desperate times is to question the goodness and existence of God. See, the, the person that's experiencing this kind of difficulty, not only is there the personal aspect of the difficulty, but then there's also those social ramifications as well. Because we all know that there are people in our lives that are observing our lives, what our lives are about, and people willing to give advice and say any number of things like, well, if, have you tried this? If you, if you just do this, and, and, and all of these methods to kind of save the day or, or win out. But then there's also those that will use heartache as opportunities just to poke holes, just to do those jabs, just to question, to, to give attacks of, How's that going for you? How's that God thing going for you? Those people that look at Jesus as just kind of being the, the, the magic token. That as long as you pacify him, then good things happen. But if, if you make him mad, well, then bad things happen. But if you're doing good things and bad things are still happening to you, what's the point? So here's this psalmist that is crying out. As, as, uh, there are those that we see in verse 3 and verse 10 that are questioning him. Where's your God? Not, not using it as a reminder of where is your God? Oh, he is present. It's not meant to strengthen faith. It's not meant to help shape in any positive way. It's just meant to taunt. Where is your God? And so the growing discouragement of what he is facing and now those that are attacking his faith, uh, of trying to poke holes at it, just to try to discourage him, to ridicule him. How's that following God thing going for you? So added to those questions, we see his own questions that are being asked in verse 2. He says, when can I go and meet with God? A literal way of saying that is, when can I go and see God face to face? It seems like God is far off. When is going to be that moment when God just shows up? Instead of him just being out there somewhere, when am I going to see God? When is it going to be where it's not a matter of where it seems like I'm just going through the secretary and I'm getting the runaround and God's always gone? When am I going to see him? So this cry of his heart and what we have to be so careful of, of those questions that we are asking ourselves because in verse 9 here he is saying, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? So we see the heartache that he's feeling. It seems like God has abandoned him. It seems like God is gone. God has left the building. What we have to be careful about is those questions of how they intertwine, the questions we hear, where is your God? And then the other question that can so easily happen, did God really say, is your God really that good? And when it seems like God is silent, when it seems like, hey, what's the response to that? We have to be careful of the kind of questions that we are listening to. But what I would pose is being careful of the kind of questions we ask so many times. We're, we're prone to say, why God? Why this? Why now? Why me? But we don't ask ourselves any questions of ourselves. Why am I? Why am I doubting God in this moment? Why am I doubting God's love? Why am I doubting his hope? Why am I doubting his faithfulness? God has proven himself over and over. And so we need to be careful of the questions that we are listening to in those moments while at the same time not being afraid to ask of God as we pursue him. See, so many times when we are crying out to God, it might seem like God is only responding to us if there is an immediate solution to our cry. If, if there is an immediate relief from the pain that we are experiencing. Um, I, I know having watched my wife deliver four babies, okay, and, and I know I say this carefully about knowing of the pain, because I, I know I don't know the pain, but I've observed the pain. And in our births that we had, um, our second pregnancy was particularly difficult, where my wife's pain level was just through the roof. Not that any of them are easy, 
But her pain level was just through the roof. And they came in and they introduced something called an epidural. And for those of you that have had one of those, you ladies, I know just the very idea of that freaks me out, of this needle going into your spine. I mean, that just, there is something about that that just freaks me out. But I do know that once she received that epidural, that pain level all of a sudden went, there was still pain, but all of a sudden now it was tolerable. If you've ever been in the hospital and you've been um, given pain relief, I know a couple years ago I was in the hospital in immense pain, and all I had to do is call the nurse, and they would come in and give me another morphine shot. Ah. See, there are those moments when we are experiencing immense pain, and we are crying out to God, and we're saying, God, I want the epidural. God, I want the morphine. God, why aren't you taking the pain away? God, why am I experiencing this pain? And it seems like there's no response. I mean, you can hit the button and the nurse comes, but you're crying out to God, and it seems like, where's God? Where's God in in those moments? Why isn't he taking that pain away? In verse 10, he describes it as as this. He says, my bones suffer mortal agony. In, In other words, he's crying out, I'm dying inside. I am dying inside. You see, this isn't just this pleasant song, oh, that's nice. It is the cry of a desperate heart that so earnestly is looking after God to, God to answer these, these cries. What I appreciate about this psalm is its rawness. That it is not all neat and tidied up. That, that it's not one of these things that um, is just easily packaged. But what we see is that here is this problem, this discouragement, this struggle that he is having. It's not just neatly packaged in the sense that here's the problem, okay, here's the solution, and by the end, oh, it's all resolved and all is good. We see the struggle of his heart as he's asking these questions, and then he's recalling to his heart, why am I downcast? Why am I in such grief? I got a hope in God. And then he goes into more struggle and talking about different things, and then he continually comes back to where his hope is. I don't want to give the false impression that, hey, you just put your trust in Jesus and everything is just great. Everything is just grand, no problems. It's only solutions because the Bible doesn't present itself that way. It admits the struggle of our hearts and yet points us to what we so desperately need in those moments. So within this psalm, we see the grief and the discouragement. We see the pain, and yet he's not succumbing to its pull of just giving up, of just tapping out, making sure that discouragement is not going to win the day. That there are going to be difficult moments and difficult days, but at the end, discouragement is not going to win the battle. Third point, in desperate times, remember what God has done and anticipate what he will do. You see, it's not only about what God will do, it's about who God is. It's about knowing his character. As we see here in verse 4, what he is recalling as he looks at his past, he says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. See, for him, this is not just remembering the good old days. Man, I remember when, I mean, I have those moments with my kids where I can say, man, I I remember when you could get gas for under a dollar a gallon. I remember when you could go to McDonald's and get a value meal for three bucks. You know, we all have those stories that we can share. Oh, I remember when I went to school and I walked 10 miles and 15 feet of snow. You know, we have those kind of moments where it's just kind of sentimentalism of the good old days. What he is doing here is he's not just recalling the good old days. Oh, I remember. He is recalling the character of God, bringing that into the present. Because sentimentalism will get us nowhere in our relationship with God. It's just, if it's just about nice feelings of the good old days, that gets us nowhere. It's about recalling what God has done and who he is that impacts the present. So we're not just living in the past. We are recalling that so it impacts our focus and our hope right now in the midst of difficult things. And for those that are followers of Jesus, our greatest hope in looking back is that God loves us. He loves us so much he sent his son to die for us. The greatest indicator of his immense love for us is what he did for us in the person of Jesus Christ. 
It's not just about sentimentalism. It's about recalling the faithfulness of God, how he's worked, how he's proven himself over and over. It's about us fighting for joy, fighting for hope, See, the question being, how, how can we make sure that we not succumb to the, the pitfalls and the trials and the difficulties of life? How, how can we be sure that we're not just going to give up, that we're not going to just tap out? It's, it's a matter of choice. We have to choose. We have to choose where our focus is going to be every moment of every day. In, in the difficulty, it's not a matter of, okay, well, I made that choice. No, in the midst of the battle, we have to remind ourselves, I choose Christ. I choose to keep my eyes focused on Christ. I choose to trust God. I choose to look to God. There is hope in nothing else. It's a battle that we face, and it's a choice that we have to make and continue to make on a regular basis that we not succumb. It's a matter of focusing on God and not turning away from him. And that's what we see in this song is his heart is crying out. And what we see in verse 5 and verse 11 and then also picked up in chapter 43, verse 5, is this common refrain, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. The cry of the desperate heart finds their consolation in God. You see, everything that people are so desperate for I want belonging, I want love, I want acceptance, I want grace, I want forgiveness, I want meaning, I want future. Everything that we so desperately cry out for, God meets the deepest need of our heart. God meets all of that. So our cry for desperation, so many times we look to other things to satisfy that can't do it. Only God can fill that. And so when we realize that, even in our most difficult of times, the cry of our heart, God, we, we need you. We need more of you. We need to pant after you. We need to be desperate for you, not just when life is hard, but in those moments when life is good and we tend to put it on cruise control. When we think, oh, God, I, I got this one. I can, I can handle this one, God. I'll leave you for the big stuff. May our cry of our heart be like the psalmist who says, as the deer pants for the water. God, our, our, our only refreshment comes from you. Our only hope comes from you. May we be more desperate for him. Because he meets us there. He's who we most need. So let's stay faithful together. Let's pray.